yeah, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. Thanks very much for this invitation. And I'm excited to share some research about the shoulders of apes and australopiths. The shoulder girdle is a region of the postcranial skeleton that connects the upper limb to the thorax. It has a few different bones in it, and the ones that I'll be talking about today include the clavicle here in the front and the scapula on the back. Because the shoulder connects the upper limb to the thorax, it plays a central role in the way apes climb and swing in the trees. Although humans can still climb and swing, it's generally agreed that we don't have the same degree of adaptations as other apes do. Ideas about how the human shoulder evolved are largely based on anatomical comparisons among the living hominoids. And there are big differences in the shoulders of apes on one hand and humans on the other. One of that difference has to do with the height of the shoulders. So you can see in humans here, we have low and broad shoulders that are separated from the head by a well-defined neck, whereas in all the other apes, the shoulders are elevated and they conceal the neck. Humans also have a unique scapula shape, as we heard. I'll continue talking about this. Um, in all other apes, they share in common a spine of the scapula that runs obliquely across the blade, the blade and the glenoid is tilted upwards, whereas in humans, that spine is transversely oriented and the glenoid faces out to the side. So because humans lack the morphology that's shared in common among all the other great apes, we assume that these changes in shoulder height and scapula shape occurred along our branch of the evolutionary tree. And fossils help us track when these changes occurred, which in turn influences the way we envision the habitats of extinct hominins and the way they moved through them. Fossils recovered by Professor Copins in the International AFAR Research Expedition during their initial field seasons would prove to be some of the most important for understanding early Australopith locomotion. As we heard yesterday from Dr. Johansson, the AL129 knee joint was the first hominin discovered by the expedition in their inaugural field season. And this specimen was so important because it provides definitive evidence that uh, afarensis was bipedal. And the very next field season, they discovered the Lucy partial skeleton, which gave researchers the first glimpse of the upper limb. That includes uh, this fragment of the scapula, which shows an ape-like upward tilt to the glenoid. So together, these specimens really foreshadowed what would become a theme in studies of the Australopith postcranium. There's a number of derived bipedal features in the lower limb and primitive features concentrated in the upper limb. And paleoanthropologists have understandably had different interpretations of this evidence. And as Arai was sharing, um, at one extreme, we have researchers who envision Australopiths as fully terrestrial bipeds, and at the other are those who envision them as bipedal when on the ground, but still partially living in the trees. And at the heart of this, this debate really lies a difference in viewing one of the hallmarks of human evolution, which is when hominins became fully terrestrial. So in this camp, the static primitive features, static meaning that they maintain their morphology for hundreds of thousands or even millions of years. Static primitive features are viewed as uh, evidence that Australopiths were continuing to use their upper limbs in an ape-like manner because natural selection is maintaining the primitive morphology because the function remains the same. In the other camp, emphasis is placed instead on the derived bipedal features, and the primitive features are seen as evolutionary baggage, simply inherited. So the upper limb is no longer involved in locomotion, but the primitive features aren't detrimental to survival or reproduction, so they remain the same. Now, some people in this room were central contributors to this debate the first time around, so I won't rehash it further. Instead, what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the time today is how new fossils and digital advancements are changing this picture slightly. And I'll give a somewhat different view than that shared by Zarai a moment ago. Before the year 2000, we simply didn't have much of a fossil record of the hominin shoulder. 
There were a few reasonably complete specimens, but those all came from the Pleistocene, and we only had a couple very fragmentary fossils um, of Australopithecus from the Pliocene. But in the past two decades, fieldwork efforts have produced amazing new specimens of the early hominin shoulder. All of these specimens are beautifully preserved, and they all come from partial skeletons. So this is really some of the material, fossil material, that we've been waiting for to answer some outstanding questions. But while evolutionary changes in things like scapula shape can be determined by comparing fossils directly, it's less clear how we can track things like evolutionary changes in the height of the shoulders or the breadth of the upper body, because these are features that are properties of an articulated skeleton as opposed to an individual bone. So how can we track changes in shoulder structure? The approach that I've been taking is to use three-dimensional CT scans where you can collect detailed landmark data on bone morphology while the bones remain in their articulated positions. I've presented some preliminary results using this approach to compare shoulder structure in apes and humans. Like I mentioned, the transition from an elevated ape-like shoulder to a low shoulder of humans is thought to be one of the major anatomical transitions in human evolution because it decouples the head from the thorax, both spatially and anatomically. Up to this point, that transition is usually discussed as the evolutionary descent of the shoulder, as if the position of the scapula actually changed from a higher to a lower position on the thorax over time. And up to this point, researchers have been using observations on clavicle shape to try to determine if the shoulder was elevated or descended in extinct hominins. The idea between this clavicle approach is that you can simply hold the bone in a standardized orientation with this acromial end parallel to the horizontal and simply see how much vertical distance there is between the two articular ends, which is represented here by this red arrow. And that vertical distance is thought to translate directly to shoulder height. So the assumption behind this approach is basically that the standardized orientation more or less replicates the articulated orientation. But using the CT-based approach, I found that this assumption doesn't actually hold up. We see the standardized orientations up here in the first row and the observed articulated orientations here and here. And what I hope you can see is, of course, that uh, these two orientations are not the same. Specifically, this end of the clavicle isn't parallel to the horizontal in articulation. And further, the difference between these two articulations varies from individual to individual, which, of course, makes a problem for this approach. So if the clavicle approach isn't reliable, is there an alternative? Here we're looking at uh, a CT scan of an ape cadaver, and this is a mid-sagittal plane used to create a cross-section through the scan stack. I recorded um, the centroid points of different structures in the scapula, so the centroid of the blade, the center of the glenoid, and the top of the acromioclavicular, or AC joint. And I recorded within an individual where each of these points fell relative to the vertebral bodies. So now we'll have a look at the data. Along this vertical axis on this plot are the levels of the vertebral bodies where the center of the blade, center of the glenoid, and the AC joint fall in all of the comparative taxa. The results show that the center of the glenoid has approximately the same position in all hominoids. The center of the glenoid is slightly more elevated in apes than it is in humans, but there's a lot of overlap between the two. We don't really see the major difference in shoulder height until we get to the acromioclavicular joint, and that's where you see a marked difference between apes on the one hand and humans on the other. It's also easy to visualize these differences using GM methods uh, by simply superimposing the mean ape configuration, which is shown here in orange, and the average human configuration, shown here in gray. The elevated clavicle and higher AC joint position of apes is obvious, but 
it's not associated with the difference in scapula position that's been assumed up to this point. Instead, the blade is sitting at about the same place in all of the taxa. Interestingly, these same differences in AC joint location and glenoid location are equally visible when we simply superimpose an isolated, disarticulated scapula. This suggests that differences in shoulder height are not a difference in moving the scapula up and down on the thorax, but instead a matter of evolving scapula shape. Now, this is really the first time that these kind of observations have been made in a sample of articulated ape cadavers. And uh, it's one way that digital methods are advancing our understanding of shoulder structure. The take home here, in my opinion, is that if we want to track changes in shoulder height, we should probably be looking to differences in scapula shape. And the clavicle is simply in whatever orientation it needs to be in order to connect its two articulations. So what do we know about the evolution of scapula shape? We've had small fragments of the Australopith scapula for decades, since the 1950s for the case of Africanus, and since the 70s for Afarensis. These fossils preserve just this fragment of the glenoid in a small portion of the axillary border. That's the standard preservation pattern for a scapula because the blade is so fragile. And with this kind of preservation pattern, the direction of attention naturally falls to glenoid orientation because that's all you can observe from these kind of uh, fragments. And looking at glenoid orientation, which is usually measured by something called the bar glenoid angle, which is the angle that's shown here. So data on the bar glenoid angle gives us the impression that the Australopiths would have looked very much like any other ape, but distinct from humans. But now that we have a much more complete fossil record, it's become clear that the Australopith scapula actually looked more similar to humans than previously understood based on those glenoid fragments. This is the scapula from the Kadanumu partial skeleton from Waranzo Mile. It's dated to about 3.6 million years old. But very similar morphology appears in South African hominins, including the scapula of the little foot partial skeleton which, as we heard yesterday, has had a number of dates, but is now argued to be even older than 3.6. And the same is true of the scapula from the MH2 partial skeleton of Sediba. That was a, just a look at scapula shape. This plot quantifies differences in scapula shape. The horizontal axis here is separating the primary aspects of shape that differentiate different species. So here on the left are falling the kind of oblique orientation of the spine and glenoid. And uh, those species that have a more transverse morph morphological pattern are falling to the right. Kadanumu is represented by this black star, and it falls between humans and orangutans, but clearly distinct from either of the African apes, our closest living relatives. Now, regardless of whether we envision the last common ancestor as having an African ape-like pattern or perhaps a more generalized pattern um, that's common to all of the great apes, what we see is morphological change over time rather than stasis. So this is where uh, afarensis falls. We also have data, or I also collected data on MH2, which is like I said, more than a million years younger and even more similar to living humans. And if we assume that the common ancestor falls somewhere around here, what we see is an evolutionary trajectory of change over time rather than stasis. So this series of fossils is demonstrating the nature of the morphological change, but of course the question that follows is what are the functional implications? It's clear that these different features have something to do with using the arms overhead in locomotion. And that's because primates that have a greater reliance on vertical climbing and suspension share this oblique morphological pattern, while those that have lesser or no reliance on these behavioral patterns show the more transversely oriented pattern. So these kind of correlational studies of functional morphology demonstrate that animals doing the same kinds of things 
show the same morphology, which is certainly evidence of functional adaptation, but it's not explaining why those features are advantageous in below branch locomotion. It doesn't tell us what they're doing. Uh, interestingly, we also have evidence of evolutionary convergence on this morphological pattern because uh, very highly suspensory New World monkeys have evolved that scapula shape independently. One of the existing ideas was that these differences in spine orientation affected the biomechanical performance of the muscles that raise the arm. And that's because the scapular spine provides attachment to muscles that are classically identified as arm-raising muscles in humans. So this arm-raising hypothesis, as I'll call it, was accepted for a long time, but it was never actually tested. Musculoskeletal modeling is one approach that's really well suited to testing these kind of ideas about how differences in bone shape affect the function of joints. These kind of models have one source of input that comes from the skeleton. It comes from articulated skeletal structure and a second source of input that comes from soft tissue features, things like muscles, tendons, et cetera. Up to this point, there had been quite a bit of work done on humans, largely in sports physiology and things like this, um, but very little work had been done on apes. I supervised the PhD researcher of uh, this wonderful wo young woman, Julia Van Biesel. She's now gotten her degree and is a postdoc in Belgium at uh, KU Leuven. And um, Julia's project used this approach to look at how gorilla versus human uh, differences in scapula shape affected shoulder biomechanics. The skeletal input for this model came from CT scanning an intact gorilla cadaver. We then dissected the shoulder, chest, and back. And as we proceeded with the soft tissue dissection, we were using a handheld scanner to capture detailed data on muscle geometry, muscle paths, origin and insertions, and how that geometry changed as we raised and lowered the arm. Then we were able to register our CT scan data set and our surface scan data set so that our dissection observations could be transferred directly into our model building space. So with this data collection protocol, we were pioneering a new way to combine traditional dissection techniques with various modes of 3D imaging. Then we compared the biomechanical performance throughout the arm raising and lowering process between our newly built gorilla model and an existing human model in order to test the arm raising hypothesis. One of the parameters that we were comparing between the models is called moment arm. Moment arm is used to quantify how efficiently the force that's created when a muscle contracts, how efficiently it's translated into rotational force that moves body parts. Large moment arms amplify muscle contraction forces. So you can think about moment arm as something that gives you more mechanical bang for your muscle contraction buck. Uh, moment arm is a property of joint geometry. It's uh, shown here in blue, and it's determined by what the distance is between the line of action of a muscle to the joint rotation center. Another thing about moment arm is that moment arms have a sign. They can be either positive or negative. When a moment arm is positive, contraction of a muscle will act to increase a joint angle, whereas when they're negative, muscle contraction will act to decrease a joint angle. And so we can understand the sign of a moment arm is telling us something about muscle action. The deltoid muscle, like I mentioned, is usually thought of as the primary arm raiser in humans. Um, and so I'm gonna talk a little bit about different portions of the deltoid and specifically about this green portion here, the spinal portion of the deltoid, that's what's attaching to the scapular spine. In humans, this green muscle um, can assist arm raising a bit, which you can see here by this positive moment arm, but it also does things like 
um, extending a shoulder when it's already raised, and that's where we see this kind of moment arm that's at zero or, or around zero. But in gorillas, this moment arm is instead negative. And this difference in function comes from the fact of spine and glenoid orientation. The more upward tilted glenoid of gorillas actually displaces the center of the glenohumeral joint upward in gorillas compared to humans. And the oblique scapular spine is pulling these fibers of the spinal deltoid downward so that the line of action of this muscle falls well below the joint center and contraction of the muscle acts to lower the arm instead of raising the arm in gorilla. So the take home here is that the morphological differences actually enhance arm lowering instead of arm raising. And that's likely true for all apes that share this kind of morphological pattern. So I've described this with one example from the deltoid muscle, but this finding was similar across all of the muscles we investigated using this approach. There's little to no differences between humans and other apes in terms of arm raising performance. All of the largest differences between humans and gorillas had to do with arm lowering. And so we've described this as the arm lowering hypothesis. And arm lowering is a movement that's actually centrally important to both vertical climbing and suspension because that's when a lot of strength is needed the most. Arm lowering muscles are what are involved in displacing the center of mass of the body upward, of hoisting the body up uh, when the supporting hand is above the, the head. And it's also important during arm swinging because the supporting hand is up, but the arm lowering muscles are contracting to displace the center of mass upward to store potential energy for an upcoming swing. So this is another way that digital advancements are improving our understanding about how the function of the shoulder changed over time. And this modeling approach can address how, in a biomechanical sense, the ape shoulder is morphologically advantageous for below branch locomotion. So to summarize, the fossil record has expanded greatly thanks to continued fieldwork efforts. But I think that we've needed some methodological advancements to really make the most out of all these new partial skeletons. And that's what I've been trying to contribute with these studies of articulated morphology. Once we have the ability to compare articulated skeletons, I think musculoskeletal modeling is a really promising approach to studying functional capabilities in a more holistic manner, where we're looking at articulated joints and their interaction with the soft tissues. So paleoanthropologists have been investigating locomotor capabilities of extinct hominins for decades, but I think that this con um, combination of an increasingly complete fossil record and digital advancements are gonna give us a new view on hominin locomotion. Thank you very much.